Hey friends, welcome to Boca, a podcast exploring the ever blurring lines between the personal and business lives of professional photographers. This is your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm happy that you can join me today in connecting with photographers and entrepreneurs as we discuss photography, business, and oh yeah, that sometimes messy thing that we call life. This podcast is brought to you by Photographer's Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com. All right, Boca Podcast listeners, welcome back to yet another episode. And uh, I'm excited to be here with a new friend of mine, Allison Coleman. Allison, thank you so much for making time for the Boca Podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, I love the Boga podcast. I actually just started listening to it last year and it's been wonderful to listen to. Well, I, and that's encouraging to me. Honestly, we, we've done at this point, I've recorded close to 170 episodes or so, and, and we're just going to keep going. I love the opportunity, first of all, just to get the chance to connect with wonderful people like yourself, uh, lots of interesting and, and varying conversation. And then ultimately, hopefully, we, we put a little bit of value out there into the industry. And in some way, the podcast uh, is helping photographers. So thanks for saying that. That's definitely encouraging. And I, I'm excited just to kind of dive into to our questions for the day. And we normally start off the podcast with uh, something called the technique for time. And I'm really curious for you as a photography business owner, what's something that you do to create space in your life for yourself, for your husband? Uh, what is your technique for time? Yeah, sure. So the first one, that, you know, I ha just have two quick ones. Um, the first one I'll say is that, you know, a lot like other photographers, we're so booked up with, you know, a million things from just doing our sessions to editing to, you know, making time to do our finances. So the thing that I've had to do is just schedule that time. So I think, you know, last year I was still working full time and doing, you know, the photography part time and I was just really run down. I wasn't really taking care of myself. And so at the beginning of last year, I thought, what can I do to, you know, make that time and to, you know, to help myself. And yeah. so, yeah, so I actually reached out to when we lived in Vermont, I reached out to a local massage place and met this really wonderful woman and scheduled a massage every Friday for myself. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And, and it was one of those things where I was like, really, you know, is this necessary? But, you know, as I kept going, I just felt really good. You know, it kind of revived me from the week and I was able to, you know, relax into the weekend. And it was also just a really good treat, you know, on a Friday, just to, <laughs> to go get a massage and to unwind. And absolutely. So, yeah. So every Friday, right after work, I would go. And it was just this constant thing I knew that, you know, was happening. You know, I, I'm, it's interesting that you bring up massage because, and this is something we haven't really talked about, at least not much before in the podcast, but I think it's actually a really important uh, thing to to make time for massage. And, you know, whether that's your significant other giving you a massage or you're going to get a massage, physical touch, uh, the, the importance of physical touch, I don't think is is emphasized enough in our culture and, you know, it's something that happens naturally with somebody maybe that we're in a romantic relationship with, but it's a healthy thing to um, to actually go and get something like a massage, both for the sake of relaxation and uh, really actually relaxation is probably the driving factor there. I know that for me personally, um, I went to, I would get massages, even if it was just a chair massage at the mall at a kiosk, I would get them regularly for a, a, actually a good bit of time there in my life where I was dealing with some personal issues and needed to kind of minimize uh, the stress that I was dealing with. And it was so extremely helpful. And um, so I, as much as it seems like a luxury probably to a lot of people, yeah. uh, in fact, I, there's, there's a uh, massage school not very far from me, probably 15 minutes from me or so. It costs about $35 to get an hour massage. There are ways that you can go about getting massages for a relatively inexpensive amount. And ultimately, we're talking about taking care of our health, minimizing stress and improving blood flow. And it's just, a, it's a great thing all around. So I highly encourage those listening in. If, if you don't get a massage regularly in some form or fashion, make sure you do because it really is a wonderful thing. And I love that you were prioritizing yourself and your health enough to do that. This goes beyond just simple luxury. It's, it's for the sake of our health. And so that's really, really interesting. You mentioned something in passing, and, and I just want to touch on this briefly, and that is 
um, making time to work on finances. Is there a particular way that you go about managing finances on a personal level or on a business level that you have found helpful? <laughs> yeah. So I, I just laugh a little bit because I was not very good in the beginning. Um, I think like a lot of other photographers or, you know, we want to create and it's like, that's the priority. Uh Um, and then this kind of, it's just, it's hard, you know, it's, it's tedious. It's, it's something that you have to, you know, make that time for. So I put all my finances in Google docs Okay. and one of the things that was really overwhelming for me, um, is even with all the apps out there, even with, you know, all the advice I've gotten about how to manage it. The easiest way for me was I just made 12 envelopes for all the months of the year. Okay. And what I did was anytime, and I keep them like in a larger envelope in my car. And so if I go out with a client or if I go and purchase something in person, I'll put the receipt in the envelope that has the month on it. Ah. Yeah. With a little number. So I started at one, you know, and then for in my spreadsheet, each month has you know, what is, what is it for? Where did you get it? How did you pay? And then it also has the number, you know, in case I do ever, you know, happen to get audited or anything like that, I have all those things. And I know that they're categorized together uh, just because I'm not, I'm not very, I was not very good at it in the beginning. And, you know, after you go through a few years of taxes, you realize how important it is to make sure you document everything. So It's true. And so uh, this brings up a number of interesting points. First of all, I've talked about this in the podcast before, but uh, finances in business, running my photography business was definitely a weakness of mine. And, you know, there was there was a lot of uh, and this sounds dramatic and I certainly don't mean it to be, but there was a lot of fear behind or apprehension behind not being more proactive with my finances. And I think, you know, this is a pretty commonly understood principle, but one of the best ways to address fear is is to increase the amount of knowledge around that thing that you're afraid of, right? And so being proactive and developing a certain amount of awareness as to how to best approach your finances when it comes to running a photography business is a great thing. Getting an accountant and and maybe even a bookkeeper on your side helping you with those things, also a great thing. Uh, But it's interesting, too, that you mention, uh, again, in passing, but, but the idea of being audited. I've actually been audited a couple of times. And it is, it just makes a world of difference, whether it's something as simple as doing your taxes at the end of the year or going to the extent of having to, you know, going, going through an audit. It's being organized, having your receipts categorized and your finances in order. It makes all the difference in the world. And if you're just proactive in the moment, it only takes a second. I mean, I love that despite, uh, as you pointed out, all the different technologies out there, you've got a system that works for you. It's the envelopes. It's putting the receipts there and knowing where you can find them. As long as you've got a system in place, that's what's most important. And, um, and I love that you've been proactive in that. But if you ever have to pull information, whether it's a receipt or an expense and notes about an expense, uh, knowing that you've got a system in place that you're proactively managing is is so, so important. And I think this is a wonderful example for our listeners. And for those of you listening in, if, if Google Docs and envelopes isn't your thing, you can take advantage of something like Expensify. Uh, this is an app that I've used for quite some time. QuickBooks, Self-Employed is another great way to go. Uh, there are plenty of applications out there that will help you do the same thing. But I, I love that. That's a really great example. Thanks for, for sharing a little bit about that for us. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And and then going on to, to free time, I mean, it's it's not uh, if, if we're not actually taking advantage of the free time that we're that we're creating for ourselves by being a little bit more organized and, and opening up space in our calendar, then uh, we're missing out. So I'm curious what you like to do with your free time. Yeah, sure. Um, so we actually have four French Bulldogs <laughs> and they kind of rule our lives in a really positive way. I (laughs) I love that you say rule your lives. Yeah, this is, do explain. (laughs) Yeah. So growing up, we never had dogs. So we only had cats and that was wonderful. But when I was probably in the sixth grade, I had seen a movie with a French bulldog. So this was a really long time ago. And I thought, what kind of dog is that? Like, it's so weird looking, like I have no idea. And I just got really like obsessed with them when I was really young. And I told everyone, you know, when I get older, I'm going to get a French bulldog and it's going to be great. And they're like, yeah, right. And then (laughs) I, you know, I got older and got my first and now we have four. Yeah. And so my husband and I love taking them pretty much everywhere with us. If we can, we take them to, we actually just bought a house and there's a dog park by it that has a beach in it. And 
we love taking our dogs to dog parks like that where they can, you know, go and socialize. And yeah. it's just like a really fun day for us. So pretty much it's our dog social calendar. <laughs> <laughs> so how does, what does it look like to transport four Frenchies anywhere for that? I mean, do you, do you have like, do they, they go into a little kennel in your car? Are they just bouncing all over the place as you're driving? What does that look like? <laughs> Yeah. So when we moved, um, when we moved, it was such a long drive, you know, it was like seven and a half, eight hours. And so we did have a pop-up kennel in the back of the car. Okay. Normally though, we have like a little doggy hammock in the back and they, they most of the time stay back there. Now, sometimes they think, you know, no, I want to sit in the front with mom. (laughs) They like try to come up and we have to like kind of push them back. But yeah, it's really funny, especially if we happen to go, you know, stop to get a drink at the drive through. People are like, oh, my God, you have so many dogs in your the back of you. Did you know that? And it's like, yep, we know that. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's fun. It's a lot of fun chaos. I would say that. That Yeah, I can picture this. It's, it seems quite hilarious. You said doggy hammock. I'm not sure I've ever heard of a doggy hammock before. What is that? Yeah. So they're really great. Um, they basically, it's like this big tarp like thing that they, and some of them have designs, but they're like waterproof and they wrap around your seat so that you and then I think the side, um, wraps around the hook that you can like hang things from. And it basically makes it so they can't really fall down and they can't get to your actual, the fabric of the seat, but it like reduces the hair and reduces the dog stuff. So, Oh man, I, I had a dog, um, not very long ago, actually named Sammy. Sammy was an amazing dog and uh, my kids loved him too, but he shed this hair that was almost like almost porcupine like quills. I mean, it was such thick hair and it would stab itself into the most random places. I mean, it, it, I would say probably a year or so. Unfortunately, we had to give him away at one point and we found a great home for him. But there there was still Sammy hair left over even a year or so after we had given him away. It was just <laughs> everywhere. And so we used to have to put down, like, I would actually lay down a tarp in the back seat when we were traveling from Chattanooga to Atlanta or otherwise uh, in order to kind of minimize the hair. The doggy hammock sounds like a little bit more efficient way to go about that process. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to have to check that out for our next dog. I, I cannot wait to have a dog. I, I love dogs. Four Frenchies sounds like a, a lot of fun. So that's really, really great. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us something kind of random that most people might not know about you. Yeah. Well, I would probably say so. One of the things is that actually where I'm from in Ohio is actually known for its buzzards. And yeah, like the bird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is a good start because this is already to- totally random. But you're talking yeah. about Cle- the Cleveland it, area. Yeah. So my parents are um, just from a suburb just south of Cleveland. It's actually okay. Hinkley, Ohio. There, uh, there's historical fol- folklore around it, but they have an actual day called Buzzard Day. Really. Yeah, where like tons of people come. And I remember when I was in school, um, kind of how I got into art, I guess, and in, in the visual arts is that they always had this contest where you they would have a theme every year. So the one theme was like royalty. And so all the kids would have to draw the buzzards in some kind of royal fashion. And it cha- the theme changed every year. But when I was in kindergarten, it was royal. And so I drew this like buzzard king (laughs) i know it's so weird and i won and it was like i still have the buzzard but it's so weird because people are like how did like what didn't you know that you liked art and i was like well it was kind of from i guess then because you know i really liked that funny yeah yeah so i don't know why i mean i I, it's something about um when the when the hunters and gatherers came back like the buzzards were like the first sign of them like living there. I, but it was just like, it's really bizarre and buzzers are actually kind of really ugly looking, but, um, yeah, it's, it's super random. Yeah. It's almost like, like a turkey mated with an eagle or something like that. They've got these massive, massive bodies. I mean, I'm assuming most of our listeners know what a buzzard is, but these yeah. just huge, huge flying monsters practically. I mean, they're, they're massive. The wingspans are probably at least four to five feet, maybe even more, maybe closer to six feet in some cases. Um, just massive things. And then they've got these heads that, that are sticking out that, that look like turkey heads. I mean, it, it is kind of random and weird looking, but that is also a random uh, fact about, <laughs> about Cleveland that <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've ever heard before. Um, photographers edit 
my editing company, I I have a couple of partners and we're actually based, our corporate office is based just outside of Cleveland, Ohio. So now I know oh, something okay. new about the Cleveland area that, that I didn't before <laughs> and yeah. about you as well. And and speaking <laughs> of your, your background in art and photography, we're going to actually get into the details of that story here in just a little bit. But in the meantime, I'm curious, what's what's one of the toughest lessons that you've learned as a photography business owner so far? I would probably say one of the one of the hardest things is when I got into this I really thought and and maybe it was you know naive but I really thought it just mattered you know you you as a photographer is you know how well you shot and after I've been doing part time for about 8 years and the more that I got into it you know I would go to different weddings with my husband would second shoot um quite a bit I think especially in the last couple of years but you know it was there was a lot of times when I wasn't taken as seriously and I don't know you know I this is from you know my perspective but you know I'm a 52 Korean American, very young looking Asian woman. (laughs) Um, So I felt that, you know, a lot of the time people, you know, they never assumed that I was the lead photographer. My husband is, you know, taller than me. He's, um, he's a male. He, and and he definitely, you know, he's very friendly and and all that, but it was kind of like, uh, I never really expected that, you know, when I would go to weddings and stuff. And so it just felt like, I had to prove myself a little bit more um, because yeah, because I was female. I think that was really hard. Um, I got really frustrated in the beginning and thought like, well, that's, you know, that's there. And when I thought about it more, it's like, okay, so maybe it feels like this and maybe this, it, it isn't fair, but what can I do? And so I, it kind of, I don't know, it kind of made me work harder, you know, and it kind of made me really go after those clients who I felt valued, you know, myself and like what I did and why I did it. And I definitely have come, you know, out the other side, you know, being more, uh, I guess, exposed to the realities of it. But at the same time, it was, you know, it was really hard. It kind of made me wonder, like, you know, why, why did, why am I doing this a little bit? Um, Just because, you know, even if I took really great photos, like who, it, if people aren't going to take me seriously. Well, so I'm, I'm curious. And first of all, I hate that you had to go through that, but I also love your proactive mentality. And you're like, okay, I need to figure out how to address this, how to deal with this and move beyond it. How did you address it? How did you move beyond that? How did you confront um, what seemed to be a little bit of, I don't know, maybe it's extreme to say sexism or racism, but, but how did you confront these issues and move beyond that? And uh, it, it just be up so, so that you could actually ultimately photograph or f- focus on, on being the photographer. So I think in the beginning I was just kind of, I was really quiet about it. You know, like if someone addressed my husband as the lead photographer, or if they said, you know, if they didn't seem to, it, you know, there were a couple of times when people kind of just ignored me a little bit because I think they thought I was just assist, you know, assisting, which is not bad, but it was just not, um, especially when you're there to be the lead, it was really hard. Yeah. So I was just a lot more direct, you know, like I would, when I went into, to greet client, you know, or the, the bridesmaids or the groomsmen, like they knew that I was the lead photographer, but if someone was, you know, asked Joe and I was like, Oh yeah, let me, sure. Let me take, you know, I happy to take your group photo, you know, and just being a little bit more assertive in the beginning, I wasn't. And that was really hard because I didn't say anything by being more assertive and kind of, you know, speaking up, I think that really helped me. And, and you've got a certain personality. I mean, that you, that you communicate, I think pretty well through your website too, that is one of just a lot of fun and energy. I mean, you get this picture of yourself in a hot dog costume and I think it's in Walmart. (laughs) Um, I, yeah. I'm sure a lot of that energy communicates well to the clients and, and they're able to connect well with you in that way too. Yeah, um, it it definitely does. And I think uh, it's really interesting that you mentioned that too, because you know this past year was a, a pretty big turning point, I think for me, um, especially going full time. And I had to get really serious about my marketing plan. And before when I was working full time in higher ed, it was kind of like, this is my primary job. And with photography, it definitely was, you know, I was invested in it, but I didn't have as much time to really think about, um, you know, as much as of a marketing plan. And so last year, I kind of struggled a little bit, you know, it's really hard, I think, to go, you know, on Instagram and see all these wonderful photographers and almost having, you know, wanting to be similar to them, but having your own voice. And so, you know, if you looked at the things that I made, like even two years ago, they were very, 
you know, I enjoy lifestyle photography and I love capturing moments and it just didn't really resonate with kind of my personality. It was more like mainstream. And then this past year when I was doing my marketing strategy, I, you know, I use the same language like that, you know, like I love we're laughing and I love, you know, doing capturing your moments. And, and I thought, you know, what, it, what would I say though? Like if I really was sitting across from them, like, what would I say to yeah, them yeah. that was really about me? And, and so I, I was like, well, I think I'm kind of a weirdo, you know, I'm kind of weird and goofy and I think things are really funny. And I, and I realized that the way that I really connect with clients is when, when we, we find something in common that we think is hilarious and, and then it just kind of blossoms from there. And so I, love I thought, that. Okay, yeah. And so I changed everything um, from, from my images to the language, you know, and, you know, even on my Instagram, like I'm really upfront now that I love tacos and that I love dogs, any dog that I meet. And that if you're goofy and you're, and you're a little bit weird, like I am, then, you know, hit me up. That's what, you know, that's the kind of clients that I want. Well, and I love, so I love this kind of shameless proclamation of, of your goofiness. I mean, it literally to the point, and, and for those of you listening, and by the way, you've got to check out Allison's website and Instagram, actually, for that matter. You were talking about your uh, photography earlier, and, and I have to say, your images are just vibrant. I mean, they, they jump off the screen, if you will. Really, really beautiful work. But you're going to want to go to Allison, A-L-L-I-S-O-N, Hopkins.com. And then uh, Instagram is Allison Hopkins Photography. And make sure you check out Allison's beautiful work. But oh, thank when you, you. Oh, absolutely. But when you go to your website, there's this little pop-up. And, and right away, you're communicating the, the so-called goofiness to people that are coming to visit you. It says, hello, friend. And there's this little arrow pointing to you in the, in the hot dog costume. And you say, I'm Allison, <laughs> and I love eating tacos, petting dogs, and dressing up in hot dog costumes at Target just to make my husband laugh. He did. <laughs> I'm also a wedding photographer who loves to laugh and meet couples who share in this kind of joy. And, you know, it's, it's so distinctive. I mean, how many photography websites are they going to go to where the photographer is in a costume like that, that I think immediately it captures their their attention and it's going to be polarizing uh and in the most positive way possible right if, if this is the kind of personality that they're at least curious about or maybe even more ideally just really want to connect with then it's going to be a probably uh, probably going to be a pretty easy sell so i love that you've just been you decided to be really really upfront with your personality ultimately you are kind of selling yourself uh, maybe in some cases even more than the photography and i think you've done a beautiful job of that Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's been a really good journey. And, and I think I, you know, I'm really happy where things are. And, you know, you, you mentioned, too, that um, that idea of comparison. And I was listening to a podcast episode hosted by Tim Ferriss with interviewing a guy named Jason Freed. Uh, he started a company called Basecamp. Some out there may know a little bit about it. You can just do a, a quick Google search for either Jason or for Basecamp. But um, Jason has started this company or started this company years ago, actually, that has, has done quite well. I mean, Jeff Bezos, who is, the, of course, the CEO of Amazon, even invested in it. And one of the things that Jason talked about is he doesn't he doesn't really make a whole lot of effort to keep up with whatever is going on in really just in culture in general, news or otherwise. And there's something about not constantly taking in information from the outside that lets you kind of focus on being yourself and building a business that is a reflection of you and what you what you're ultimately enjoy doing most. And I don't know that I personally would go to the extreme of kind of cutting out the outside world altogether, but I know that there is uh, a good bit of conversation in the photo industry about this uh, the problem, which is comparison, right? And it's good to mm -hmm. be aware of your market so that you can position yourselves against them when it comes to, to actual marketing efforts, creating a brand position that's distinct, that's unique. And we're going to get to that here in just a second. But uh, ultimately, being yourself is definitely the best way to go, focusing on that. And, and you've done a, a wonderful job of that. So again, kudos to you for that. I, I do want to get to your brand position, though. Talk to us a little bit about how you set yourself apart from other photographers in the Cleveland market. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think a lot of it is, you know, a lot having to do with what I mentioned with marketing, my marketing plan. So when I was in Vermont, I did a lot more. I actually worked primarily in the Berkshires. Um, it was really close to where I live, right over the border of Vermont. And so our our clients actually there were coming from all over. The, uh, the Berkshires is very much a destination area. Sure, yeah. So we would get couples from Brooklyn, couples from the Silicon Valley, a lot of California couples. And so it was it was a little bit different there because, you know, we, there was probably like five or six really strong photographers living there. And we all it was really cool. We were in part of this collective and we were able to take on clients there. So the marketing, you know, the brand, it, it mattered. I think what when I looked at Cleveland, though, like what you're saying is I needed to to really understand my brand and to really understand what I was conveying and how that, you know, look, you know, look in comparison to what was already there. And yeah. so, yeah, I would, I would definitely say my, my position is, you know, I am a Cleveland wedding photographer and lifestyle photographer, but I am really all about that unscripted, very artful looking, like you said, vibrant photos. I was a little bit worried just because, you know, I think what you said before is that there's these, you know, trends and there's these aesthetics that are, that are wonderful. And I, I kind of, you know, when I got into it thought, well, maybe I should be, you know, more light and airy. Maybe I should be more dark and moody and have that matte look, you know, and I was kind of like imposter syndrome, like what, well, what, what should I be? And so when I, when I came down to it, no matter what I did, my tendency and my gravitation always went back to these very colorful, rich photos, you know, that weren't either of the, those styles. And so, yeah. So when I'm thinking about my brand, I, I tell people, you know, I want a warm, uh, I want warmth and I want vibrancy and I want you to feel like these photos are just like the really cool moments of your life, you know, whether it's like your friends and you were like hanging out at the end of your wedding, you know, and it's, it's those moments that you don't even remember, or yeah. it's, you know, you and your dog that you didn't think you could bring to your shoot, but you asked me and you could, and, you know, and, and those are the, those moments that you want for your engagement, but also just to have of you and your dog. And so definitely for those who are goofy, who are a little bit more eccentric, but yeah, just kind of like a, I would say a mix of realness and the fact that like my photos are a lot more warm and vibrant, but also for clients who enjoy that goofiness. Yeah. On, on the homepage of your website, again, alisonhopkins.com, it says photos that are unscripted, artistic, real. And, and then you say, I wholeheartedly believe photos should reflect exactly who you are, be filled with genuine moments and feel as comfortable as possible. Um, and, and so to that point, I mean, would you say that your website is kind of the primary means with which you communicate your brand position? Are there other ways in which you do that through the whole experience with a client? What does that look like? Yeah, I think the website is the primary way. I definitely overhauled that last year. There was a lot less, I think, you know, like my bio was more, mostly like just like where I went to school. It wasn't as personal. So, you know, I worked really hard to make that as as open and as inviting as I can. And then I also thought about really hard about the language I use for emails. You know, it's not that anything was wrong with my past emails, but they were more, I would say, informative than indicating, you know, the brand or my personality. Yeah. And so I, you know, I thought really hard about that. Like, for example, like right when I moved, I did offer a couple free engagement shoots, you know, and I said, you know, I'm looking for must haves, you know, like you must like to eat. <laughs> you must <laughs> like to be adventurous and, you, you know, have a good time and enjoy slow dancing in public, you know, just funny things. And I had several couples, you know, say like, we're really interested. But of course, you know, whenever you offer something that's free, you know, there is, I think it's natural to say, but like, what's the catch, you know? And for me, you know, I, I was like, well, should I, should I tell them like where I'm coming from? Like that I'm new, that I am looking for clients or should I, you know, not. Uh, and what I decided is I, I spent a lot of time writing and I, and I save all my emails in a template folder so that, you know, I can go back to them. But I just was really honest and, I'm, and I wrote, you know, I'm going to be really honest with you. I, this shoot is completely on the house. I want to meet you. You seem like a great couple, but I would love to shoot your wedding. Yeah. Like that's, that's part of it. But 
in no way, shape or form is this like a contractual, you know, like just because you take this doesn't mean that, you know, I will be your wedding photographer, but coming from just like being honest with you. Yeah. I would love to shoot your wedding. And I was, I wasn't sure like what the response would be if people would, you know, want to not do the engagement session, but every single couple that I said that to said, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that you're honest, you know, and I, that's so good. And I agree that like, I really want to get to know my photographer, you know, and obviously feel comfortable about who we're um, booking. But I think that's great that you're doing this and that you, that you are conveying that because there's so many times where you maybe see something on Facebook, this is click here for a free, you know, whatever. And you're not really sure. Do you have to, what do you have to do? Well, as you said, like, what's the catch, right? You, you well, right, right. What's the catch? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, engagement sessions are a wonderful way to get to know clients if you're a wedding photographer. And then this was something, actually, looking back at my wedding photography career, it was probably my, uh, or at least one of my favorite things about being a photographer was the engagement sessions. Because you have these short span of time where you're you're working with a couple who you haven't worked with before, likely. And um, you need to figure out how to connect with them and within a relatively short amount of time, be able to capture some really great photographs that hopefully are lit well. You're capturing real emotion, the connection between the couple. It's a, it's a great challenge, but definitely a great way to be able to connect with with a client or even a potential client. So that's uh, that's kind of an interesting way to go about the process. And then I love that you emphasize the importance of the way that you communicate, even through something like email. Um, this is something that I've even done at Photographer's Edit, emphasizing that while we maintain some type of professionalism, why you know we're we're looking even um, at the details like grammar and sentence structure and the way that we're communicating with clients or potential clients, that we're also communicating in a certain level of informality. And at the end of the day, we're your friend, and the way that we communicate should not only communicate that friendliness, but also a certain amount of energy. You know, don't hesitate to throw a couple of exclamation points at the end of a sentence to to show some excitement and interest in engaging in conversation. So I, I love that you emphasize that as well. I think that's really, really great. Talk to us a little bit about your your gear. This is a fun one for me. Like if I if I look at my photographic equipment, the equipment that I have at this point, uh, in particular, for example, my favorite camera is probably a medium format Yashica twin lens camera that is just a, it's a jewel of a camera. It takes incredible images, but do you have a particular piece of, of gear, a camera body lens, an accessory of some kind that's a favorite of yours? Yeah, definitely. So I would say my uh, lens of choice is definitely my 85 1.4 it's a Nikon brand lens. Yeah. It's it's wonderful. Just the 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 creaminess of the bokeh on it is just it's unreal. So I love using that for portraiture. I it's it's also great too for you know like cocktail hour. I'm um, getting those really candid but really sharp photos. Sure. So I love that. And this this year I actually did invest in getting the new um, Nikon D850. Oh. And yeah, it's you know, and everyone was like, you know, it's it's such a great body. I had the eight hundred, and I love that. Yeah. And so when I made the switch, it was just I. You probably could hear me like squealing with delight all over <laughs> my mind, like <laughs> running around being like, oh my god, and you know, showing my husband like, look at this photo, and yeah. it's just oh my goodness, like just having a piece of equipment that knows you, like it's so it's cra- you know, it's crazy, it's crazy good, it's crazy fast, it it just it's wonderful. I, that I that camera, that. <laughs> yeah, and that camera's gotten rave reviews too. Have you have you shot any video with it? I have actually, yeah. I am just for fun, but I have shot video, and it's, I mean, it's beautiful. Yeah. It's just the the colors, the the smoothness of it. I've tried different lenses with it, but it's it's wonderful. Oh. It's awesome. Well, and of course, and and maybe you, you're aware of this, but um, in just the last week or so. Uh, Nikon has teased an upcoming mirrorless camera. Have you heard anything about that? I have. I have. And I'm super curious. I'm super excited about what they announce. Yeah. (laughs) It's going to be interesting to see how this game, you know, I mean, Sony obviously has taken the lead in in that regard, but uh, it'd be interesting to see what Nikon and Canon do. But uh, man, I I miss, I shot Nikon during about a decade of, of photographing weddings and you get to know a camera in a certain way where like I can close my eyes and just feel what it felt like to hold the camera bodies that, you know, that, that I'd shoot with. Um, you get to know the ergonomics and where those buttons are and it just becomes second nature, kind of muscle memory. 
And right. um, so I'm, I haven't actually had the opportunity to play with an 850 yet, but uh, hopefully one of these days I'll, I'll get to. Um, but let's, let's kind of take a step back here a little bit and talk a little bit about the background of your photography business, kind of how you got here. Because when you reached out to me and we were, you were kind of talking about what we might discuss on the podcast today, uh, you said that you'd recently moved, and you alluded to this earlier too, moved your photo business from Vermont to Ohio, and and you've you've been through a lot of transition, both recently and then even prior to that. So let's go back, first of all, to just how you got into photography. Talk about the myriad of careers that you've taken on and, <laughs> and then what that, that process looked like to go from those to professional photography. Yeah, sure. So it's a, uh, and I'll try to keep the backstory brief. Um, but you're you're right. I there have been a lot of just physical transitions, like actually moving, and then also just um, as far as career too. So I went to school in Southern Ohio at Ohio University, and I actually majored in bassoon performance. No um, way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, fellow musicians unite! I was I was a clarinet performance minor, so. Oh, hey. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm always, it's super, and I meet a lot of photographers who actually did, you know, music in some capacity. So that's really exciting to hear. Yeah. Did you, did you play, um, an, an orchestra or orchestras over, over the years? I did. I did. Um, so with our, with our school, you could be, well, they would have you audition and then you were placed in the wind ensemble, um, usually with bassoons because it's such an orchestral instrument. They would, you know, you would be an orchestra too. But they also had pit and pit orchestra for yeah. the theater stuff. And then I also was in the marching band, the Marching 110, which is like very um, famous in, you know, in Ohio. But it's a show style band. And we I played the saxophone in there. So How we fun. were. Yeah. So it was kind of all music all the time. I, I played saxophone as well. I, I played clarinet from the time I was in fifth grade up into college and, and certainly beyond. But uh, I also played soprano saxophone. The fingerings uh, are essentially identical between soprano sax and a B flat clarinet. And so it was easy to make that transition and kind of add a little bit of flair to my musicianship playing the saxophone. It was so much fun. My, my son now plays alto sax and is tapping into the jazz world. And I'm, I'm really stoked for him. He's been working really, really hard at that. But that, oh, this nice. is really great. Okay, so so yeah. keep, keep us going with the, with the story. This is interesting. Yeah, sure. So I I studied there for four years, got my degree in music, and I right at the end of my fourth year in school, I that's when I first got my first camera. And I think a lot of times people, you know, and it's totally you know normal. I think to have a friend who is taking photos or. Um, you know, just getting into it because you're curious. Mine also, you know, came from that. I had this tendency when I was uh, watching films. So I, I'm really into the Lord of the Rings. I'm really into Wes Anderson films. Okay. I love the film Amelie. So those films, like sometimes when I would watch them, I would pause them and has to be like, you know, that's such a really beautiful shot. Yes. Like that's such a beautiful look. Like how did, look how they did that scene. And that really drove my passion to getting into photography because I would say, I want to take photo. I want to capture a moment like they did in this scene. You know, I would pause the film and I would just like look at the screen. And so oh, it, when it, I was, it's such a great form of inspiration. I, that was, that was definitely an impactful medium for me learning how to become a better photographer, especially when it came to seeing light and then utilizing light in my photography movies were a huge inspiration. I remember that experience with uh, Pride and Prejudice, the more recent version oh, yeah. with Kira Knightley. Not the most exciting movie in the world, but visually it was just, it was stunning. Um, so oh, I, can, yeah. I can totally relate to that inspiration through movies. Yeah, it's it's really it's really great. And I, I know exactly, I love that film. But yeah, they did such a great job cinematically. Um, so yeah, so I so I watched all these films and I was like, you know, I really want to try it. So I went and got my first camera. It was a Nikon D90. It was, um, I loved it. And um, from there, I kind of just, you know, my friends would be goofing around and I'd take their photo. And, you know, from there, someone said, oh, I know this couple, they're doing a really small wedding. Do you want to take photos for them? Sure. You know, and so it kind of started there. But very quickly, I moved from Southern Ohio up to Connecticut. I actually went to the University of U uh, Connecticut, UConn for graduate school. And I went for higher education and student affairs. 
And um, basically what I studied is how uh, students, you know, go to college and not only they're learning in school, their academics, but also how do they develop as people, you know, how do they, yeah. So uh, I loved it because a lot of it did have to do with psychology. So learning about, yeah, all those theories about how they develop, how do, you know, how do they have ethics, how do, or they develop their ethical belief system. And, and so it was great. I, worked in a lot of programming and activities, which is great. So, you know, one day, uh, you know, I would be helping set up a ball pit for like a, you know, a festival. And the next day I would be, you know, having, doing a workshop for students on how to make, you know, good decisions. And so it was, I really, really, really enjoyed it. But, you know, I was there for two years and I got to know that area really well. I had a lot of, all my marketing was word of mouth, but I did several weddings. I did a lot of family sessions and my first job right after was in DC. So I moved down to DC and worked at uh, the George Washington university down there and did photography on the side again. And there's a lot of young people and families and it was great. And getting into that market was wonderful. Um, but then quickly after two years, um, especially in higher ed, the, the idea is that you are there for two, maybe three years, and then you move on, um, especially if you're looking to move up to a more like direct, um, like a director role. Sure. And so I was down there um, really enjoying it. I took the metro every day to my job. It was very different than Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> I, I <laughs> can then, imagine. You're talking about all this, all this change, though. Do you enjoy change? Do you like the variety or was it a little bit challenging? You know, I think at the time it was really challenging because I had lived in Ohio my whole life and never experienced even these, you know, culture shocks of living in the city. So, yeah, I think it was it was a little stressful. But now that we've done it so many times, it just seems kind of normal to to move a lot. (laughs) But I'm really excited that we're not anymore. But yeah, yeah, I would say that it definitely was stressful, but it was really fun you know, the stories I have and just the experiences. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so you're, you're there in the DC area. How did you end up in Ohio and kind of talk about, or I guess you went from there to to Vermont. Is that right? Yeah. So I was there for two years. Then I went back to Connecticut and then got another job right actually after a year in Bennington, Vermont. And so I was at the um, Bennington College for about two years. And while we were up there, my husband and I, you know, we were thinking about, you know, I really wanted to do full-time photography, but I didn't want to go full-time in an area that we weren't going to stay in. Um, Just because it's, you know, it's so much time to really cultivate your market and to really get those clients and to establish yourself. Um, but I knew because of our pattern, you know, our pattern, we were constantly moving. What were we going to do? And so my husband is actually a band director. He's a music teacher. And we started looking towards Ohio and he found this really great job in the Cleveland area. And yeah. we kind of said, you know, if you get it, that's great. If you don't, we'll, you know, we'll stay. It's no big deal. And he got it. So it was kind of like, all right, that's, that's it. So the moment we knew that we were even possibly leaving, I started working on my website, you know, like the new one and, and started making plans and wrote my marketing plan for how I was going to, you know, basically, you know, come to Ohio and, and establish myself. This idea of kind of proactively planning a move is, is a, um, it's, it's, uh, first of all, it's admirable. I mean, I love, I love the strategy or the strategic thinking behind that because it's easy. And, and I've certainly been guilty of it as a photographer to not to, really have a plan so much as just kind of diving in and going for it. And I think there's something to be said for that as well. Uh, but I love that you were very proactive in that process. And that really kind of segues beautifully into my next question, which has to do with this transition from Vermont to Ohio. It's happened just recently. And yet you told me that you've already booked up half of your availability for 2019 wedding. So, I mean, we're obviously 2018. Um, you're already booking up well into 2019. And you said that what enabled this quick success is the fact that you took advantage of every single opportunity that came your way. Um, I, I, again, I love the proactive mentality that drives that kind of behavior, but I'm curious if you describe what that actually looked like, kind of walk us through that transition to the new market. Yeah, sure. So what I did, um, th- you know, right when we knew that we were moving back is I may, I just took out a piece of paper Um, and I wrote down 
every opportunity, like every resource that I had at my disposal, you know, whether it was as simple as, you know, you know, putting some money towards a Facebook ad or, you know, just calling up brides that I had worked up, you know, worked with before. And I, you know, I totally brainstormed. I, I put everything down that I had. Yeah. And from there, you know, I said, well, what can I do right now to make a difference in between now and when I move there in June? And one of the things that I thought was, you know, it's, it's, it's very, it's very saturated in the Cleveland area. It's very different than living in rural Vermont, you know, where there's not as many, um, as much competition. Sure. And I said, but I, I really feel like if I can just get, if I can get someone to work with me, if I can get people to, um, just see me face to face and just give me a chance and, you know, really just take their photo, I think I can really build relationships, but how do I do that? You know, how do I get there? Hmm. And because I, because I wasn't living in Cleveland at the time, you know, I knew that I couldn't just, you know, walk around even like one of my things on my list was, you know, make appointments with vendors. Well, it's really hard, you know, if you can't physically go see them. And I really wanted to do that. You know, I wanted the first impression of was me meeting them for coffee or lunch or coming to their venue. And so, I decided that, you know, I was going to, I was going to do it and I was going to do it big. And so there was, I think a, maybe like two months before Memorial Day was happening and I had some time from my regular job and I said, I booked a ticket, <laughs> I think like that evening, even before I had anyone signed up. And I said, I'm coming the Thursday before Memorial Day and I'm leaving the Tuesday. I'm filling my calendar with as many couple shoots as I can. And I want them to be all over iconic places in Cleveland because I knew that my SEO needed a lot of work um, just because I was not, you know, nothing on it. Language, words, tags were anything towards Ohio. Sure. And so I opened a spreadsheet and I chose 25 different places around Cleveland that I knew I wanted to blog about. Wow. Yeah. And then I made time slots every day. I think there was between eight and 10 per day. And I just went at it. I went to every Facebook community of suburbs around Cleveland. So there's like Hudson, Ohio, Lakewood, Ohio, Rocky River, you know, all those small communities. A lot of places on Facebook do have, you know, kind of just open chats for, for people who live there. And I said, hey, like my name is Allison. I am moving back for the first time in a long time and I'm really excited and I would love to offer a couple of sessions to get to know the areas and to also just to get to know you. Um, and people were really receptive. I booked those 40 couples probably within two weeks. Um, I had couples who were interested way after that I had to say, sorry, you know, I, I only have <laughs> like this much um, time when I'm there. And yeah. And I think a lot of the, the planning that I had from my career in higher ed really helped, you know, especially in event management, just sending confirmation emails and saying, you know, sending the Google map link, here's where your um, session is. Here's where, here's the time. And this is, you know, and this is where we're going to meet after. And fast forward to May, I flew in and did 40 sessions over four days. That's incredible. How, how long yeah. was each session? <laughs> Each session was 30 minutes and then the buffer was 30 minutes um, just so wow. you know we had time to go to the next one. It was really intense. I think when we edited it up, you know, it was like 20 hours of shoot time. So it was like doing over two weddings, I think, you know, just back to back. But, you know, it, it was really intense. And of course, when we came, it was, you know, like 101 degrees in Cleveland. Oh, <laughs> so yeah. It was really hot. It was really hot. But my brother was a big help. He's actually an aspiring photographer. And so he came in. He It was great for him, you know, as someone who's training to get all that experience and sure. kind of seeing how to do that. But yeah, I worked with 40 couples. It was great. And the other thing that I did was I sent out a Google form that asked the couples questions about, you know, you know, how do you meet? Where, where are your favorite places to go around Cleveland? Um, just so that when I did the um, blog, it wasn't like I was had to write the entire thing. You know, I could write. That's cool. 
yeah, it just so because I knew it was going to, you know, with 40, 40 couples, it's a lot to blog. So especially, yeah, yeah I, I, it always cracks me up when, when you see photographers, I'm sure I've, I've been guilty about it too, but they, they, there's a tendency to just kind of use the same language with every blog post. I'm so excited to have the opportunity <laughs> to dot, 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 you know, photograph so-and-so. It was such a wonderful experience photographing. So it's, yeah, it's easy to, to just use the same language all the time to actually give the the subject, the couple in this case, the opportunity to kind of feed you those words, the backstory, the, how they're connected or whatever it might be. Um, I, I think that's a really, really great idea. Do you still do that with, with your clients now? I do. It was something that really worked well. People, you know, I was like, well, maybe they won't do, it, but everyone pretty much did it. And it was really cool hearing, um, they mentioned places I didn't even know, you know, and so I would tag those places as well. So yeah, I think I, that may, that inspired me now to work, you know, as far as the questionnaire I give to my, um, couples for their weddings, definitely include that stuff too, you know, so I can have more content to, to post in their blog. Well, I'm, I'm really so impressed and inspired by your kind of go-getter mentality The again, the proactivity in going and just, I mean, you don't even know people in the area. You're jumping on Facebook uh, groups and, and just messaging people and saying, Hey, I'm available. You want to shoot? And 40 sessions in just a couple of days is really, really impressive. It's obviously translated now to, I um, mean, we fast forward, what about a year or so? And, and you've got this well-established business there in the Cleveland area. And so I got to give you major props for that very proactive mentality and and throwing yourself into it and just going for it and 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 I'm sure your personality was was a huge hit with with these people who are getting you should have showed up to these shoots with with the hot dog costume on I'm sure that would have made yeah. even more of an impact <laughs> yeah no I know now I'm like I should have bought that you know I could have probably used more shoots oh it's so funny but but yeah. it, you know to that point I'd, I'd love to to make this even more practical and tangible for our listeners, because whether a photographer is getting ready to move to a new market or they just need to put some new energy behind their business, maybe it's falling off, they're not getting the bookings that they want to. Can you give some, some uh, or share some big ideas or principles maybe that enabled you, that helped drive you to take advantage of opportunities in a way that maybe they can translate to their businesses as well? Sure. So one of the things that I would say is and I and I learned a lot of this by I really admire Jenna Kutcher and I listen to her podcast as well and yeah. I love she's also very upfront about her personality and one of the things that she talks about is to serve your clients first and I think it's one of those things that you hear a lot but you know when it comes to practice I think you know especially if this is your full time you you need to make the sales like you need to get clients you need to be booked up and it's obviously like I totally understand, but even approaching it and actually the, the sessions I did were just this past May. So when I was looking at, you know, how can I make this impression on, on people? I, I didn't want to just make, say I need to book somebody. So, yeah. you know, this is why. And so I, I made it very fun. And, you know, when I was with them, I asked them a ton about the, you know, them like, do you work here? Like, you know, like, how did you meet? Like, what do you like to do? And, I didn't, you know, even at the end, I, I made it really, uh, um, you know, I tried really hard to make it very fun and informal and not about selling. And I think that's the same with the engagement sessions that I did also, you know, I, I said, you know, I would love to shoot your wedding, but the, mo you know, the most important thing right now is that I get to know you. And so I, I would say that is a big part of it. The other thing that I did was I, you know, I'm constantly meeting new photographers in the area. And my goal um, now that I'm back is to meet with at least three vendors a week, wow. um, whether it's, yeah, whether it's photographers or florists or, you know, caterers. And the thing is like, you know, I, maybe I could have brought business cards. Maybe I could have said, you know, I want to be in a like referral, you know, uh, relationship with you. But I think it's really important when we talk about being authentic, when we talk about being real is to really be that. And so when I meet with them, I don't even bring up really photography. If they want to talk about that's fine. But I don't, you know, like I don't say like, well, I'm here today because I want to make a relationship with you, you know, or anything like that. It's, it's very like, tell me about how you got into what you're doing, you know, and 
you know, what can I, how can I help you? And it's been such a great model, I think for me and, and, and learning that from, you know, Jenna Kutcher's podcast, but putting it into practice has been super helpful. And a lot of the couples that I worked with in May, you know, are there, we're going to get drinks, you know, we're going to dinner, we're seeing each other again. And I've happened to book a lot of the weddings I have for next year already. Um, even in these, the last three months, just because, you know, I was, I wanted to cultivate those relationships. So I think number one is that's really important. If you're not, if you're really struggling, be open and and go out and do it. You know, find people that are like you. Find people who are not like you. Find people who you would love to just get coffee with and, and do it. That was probably number one for me. Yeah, you know, and this is a really important point, too, because I, we, we talk about, I mean, so much of the book of podcast uh, centers around how we spend our time, right? Working efficiently so that we have more freedom, more flexibility in our lives. And when I look at it, especially wedding photographers, but photographers in general, so much of their time is taking up, taken up by sitting in front of the computer editing. And if you find a resource like Photographer's Edit or another company or even an in-house assistant of some kind that is able to take that editing work off your hands, you've now freed up 10, 15, 20 hours a week at least uh, just in editing. And the question at that point, of course, is what do you do with that free time? And aside from taking advantage of it on a personal level, I think probably the most important way to utilize that time when it comes to building your business is developing relationships. And so I love that you've prioritized not just meeting with one person a week, but three people a week, because you should, I mean, as a wedding photographer in particular, you should be able to effectively run your business and with maybe 10 or 15 hours of work a week. Beyond that, you should be focusing on relationships. That is what is going to drive your business. And um, so I love that you've prioritized that. Going back to the first point you make too, I have to just reiterate this, the idea of serving your clients first, making them the priority. It's so easy as photographers, as artists to get caught up in, in what we want and you know the brand that we want to communicate and our artistic prowess and, and so on and so forth. The ego gets in the way a lot of times. At the end of the day, it's about the client. We can't effectively run a business unless we make it about the client and these in this day and age too in particular when everybody kind of knows everything about everyone due to social media and and uh, the, the wonders of the internet uh, if we're not focusing on the client if we're not ultimately kind and selfless when it comes to interacting with and taking care of our clients the word's going to get out and um, you can't hide behind you know the 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 notion of being an artist the so-called artist anymore it's got to go beyond that and so I love that you emphasize that as well but but continue to walk us through some of these principles because this is really great. Yeah. I would say the second thing, and, and you talk a lot about this too, and I think it's great, is this this notion of, you know, of managing time. And so what I did is, you know, we're so busy and I know that spare time is like, you know, a laughable thing sometimes. But for me, um, I try to maximize um, my knowledge even when I was in default mo- mode. So when I was, even if I was driving, you know, a little bit of ways to get to an appointment, I would turn on the Boga podcast. You know, I would turn on, there's a bunch of other podcasts I listen to too, you know, during the week. And yeah. I love how you, you know, and y- yours is great because you touch on all these topics that, you know, I, I know a little bit about, but maybe not at all, you know, a lot. And you bring on experts and, so if it's one day I'm listening to like someone else's workflow, you know, I'm like, oh, that's really, that's really interesting. I need to do that. Or if I hear a podcast about, you know, like a new app that I, you know, should try. Yeah. So I try really hard to when I'm, even if I'm in default mode or if I'm commuting or I'm doing something like that, I'm always trying to learn something that I don't. And same with, you know, when I knew I was doing this full time, I went on Amazon and, you know, bought Tim Ferriss's four hour work week. You know, I wanted yes. to read uh, everything out there that I could and just to learn more. Um, and so I would say even, you know, and, and it doesn't have to be like every moment that you have thinking about your business, but when you do have maybe those pockets of time where it's, you know, still part of your work day, how can you incorporate more knowledge or how can you learn more things just in passing? And that was really helpful to me. Um, I listen to podcasts all the time, even before I moved here. And a lot of it is, you know, just keeping up with what's happening in the industry. Yes. So that was really helpful for me. 
Yeah, and this is really good advice. You know, it, it's funny. I was actually spending a good bit of time commuting in, in and around the Atlanta area for for a while. And it was so frustrating to get stuck in traffic. You know, it feels like somebody else is controlling my time uh, in a sense. But there's really no reason in that case or whether you know, maybe somebody's late showing up to an appointment that you'd scheduled with uh, or otherwise. There's, there's really little reason these days, thanks to technology, to complain about that because we have an opportunity at that point to take advantage of that time and to, to grow, to learn ourselves, to, to take care of business, um, send a you know quick note to a friend or a significant other or a family member. I mean, there, there are ways that we can capitalize on our time. And I love that you prioritize that. I'll add a little bit of caveat here, though, because I, it, I love listening to um, podcasts as well. I tend to go to probably three, two or three or four of them in particular on a more regular basis. And then also audiobooks are another great way to take advantage of time in the car. Um, the flip side of this, though, is that it, it, there's so much information out there. It's easy to consume constantly and yet not do anything about it. Um, Allison, you're a wonderful example of somebody who is is very proactive and in taking information that you're learning and doing something with it. But I would encourage all of our listeners, go beyond just consuming the content, listening to the podcast or the audiobooks or reading blogs or scrolling through Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or otherwise – do something with that information. Because if you're to take, I mean, take the four hour work week, uh, it's a powerful, powerful book. Uh, I think back in the day when Tim released that book, it was easy for people to look at that title and just kind of write the book off. You know, that's a nice idea, but it's not really applicable to me. And the reality is that a book like that, if you take the basic principles in that book and you apply them to your business, even now, and the book's probably, what, about 10 years old or so now, um, that it would make a drastic difference in the amount of freedom and the flexibility that you have as a business owner, but you have to actually apply it. And that's the key here. There's lots of information out there to be consumed in this day and age, uh, but make sure that you're actually doing something with it. You take, whether it's a small piece or a big piece of information, you go apply it to your business. And maybe it doesn't work. Maybe you have to nix it, but at least you're doing something with it. And there again is that idea of proactivity. So I want to encourage all of our listeners uh, with that thought, but take us to the to the next big idea, Allison. Yeah, I think that's really, it's actually a great segue to what you just said too, is um, learn about the technical things, even if it's a challenge. So a lot of times, you know, I and I'm I do this all the time too. When someone's talking about something like SEO, like last year, if you asked me about SEO, I'd be like, I I don't know, I've heard about it, but I don't know a lot about it. And it was kind of like this mental block, like I don't know, it sounds really hard, so I'm you know I'm not going to worry about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think really challenging yourself and saying, okay, I don't know that much about it, but I'm going to take you know part of my work day today just to read about it. What can I read, learn about it? What can I what are the, are there actionable steps that I can take to, you know, help my website yeah. with SEO? Maybe I don't have to be an expert on it, but what can I do to know that I'm, you know, doing something for it? And so I think that's exactly me. You know, last year, my blogs were, this was really fun. And thank you so much, you know, X and Y. And it was just the photos. I didn't know anything about, you know, doing alt text. I didn't know anything about naming the location, even naming the location of where we shot, I was very like, you know, this is just a very whimsical thing for me. But when you're thinking about it, it's like, well, when I think about clients, if I, when I was, you know, we just got married two years ago, when I was looking for a photographer, I literally just typed in Cleveland wedding photographers into Google. And, you know, the way that you help your rank on Google is through SEO. So there's, you know, there's certain things where it might seem like, oh, I have time, like, you know, I'll worry about that later. But what, you know, like if you can take the time now, and even if it's hard, and even if it's something you don't want to do, just taking that those that moment and just learning about it enough that you're making a difference or making an impact on your business, I think is huge. It is so huge. And and I, I, I like too that, um, what you're communicating there, aside from, again, that the, the wonderful theme of proactivity is, uh, a balance, right? So it, you may not need to learn everything about that particular topic, but awareness is so important. And then you can find a professional that kind of helps supplement that effort, right? So when it comes to something like SEO, um, I, I'm certainly not an expert in it. I realize the significance of it and uh, I'm able to go hire a professional um, to help me implement uh, more effective SEO strategies with my company's website. 
but awareness is important. And, and I love, again, that, that tendency toward proactivity that you have, despite fear, despite apprehension, despite concern, despite lack of knowledge, uh, you know that it means something for your business. And so rather than setting it aside uh, or putting it off, you go do something about it. And I think it's a wonderful example for our listeners. Take, take us to another one. Yeah, I think this one um, is to really think about your strengths outside of being a photographer. What value can you add to somebody's experience? What value can you add to even just the communication that you have with them for, you know, whether it's something of interest that you have, whether it's something that you know is interest to them. So I think a good example um, is when I'm working with couples, you know, and I do have meetings where if we meet to, you know, Sometimes they like to sign the contract in person. Sometimes we do, you know, they pay their deposit in person. Um, not all the time, but when we have those meetings, you know, I'm thinking, okay, well, we'll meet for coffee. We'll sign the contract. But what, how can I make that better for them? You know, how yeah. can I make that, ex- even if it's only 15 minutes of time? And so I'm, I love home goods. I, I love TJ Maxx and home goods. I, <laughs> I practically, you know, I go there all the time. And so they have tons of like really cute little gifts for, um, wedding season. Now I, yes. they even have a whole section. And so I put some of my investment, you know, or in money for my business into just getting them, you know, a his and hers, you know, wine glass set, or, um, I'm really, <clears throat> I really enjoy, um, growing succulents. I love plants and I love tending to them. So yeah. I always have an abundance of succulents around the house. It's like crazy. So, um, you know, I'm like, okay, well I'll bring them a succulent plant, you know, just something that maybe can say, Hey, thank you so much for spending your time with me, even if it's driving 10 minutes to meet me for your deposit. Yeah. But what can I do that is maybe, you know, I grow succulents. So why not share with you with the succulent or I pop into home goods all the time, you know, maybe just some small gift or some small token to say like, thank you so much. And I think that goes like such a long way, especially, you know, later, you know, when they're after they're married and after you're done taking their photos, they have that plant forever, you know? And so if someone says like, oh yeah, that's a cool plant. Where'd you get it? I, it matters, you know? And so these things that being thoughtful and I think just taking it even a step further of just saying, how can I be a good photographer to you? But also being like, how can I just be like nice to you? You know, how can I make your experience better just because of who, wh- what I like and what I can give to you? Uh, yeah, I, I love how you're letting your personality shine through in that again. And, you know, something like succulents might seem insignificant, but I, I think you're right. I think people will see that, hey, this is this is a reflection of Allison. Um, and it's that much more meaningful. She's been growing this thing in her house and now she's giving it to me. But it also speaks to the significance of, of gifts, um, you know, working with higher end clients in the Chattanooga market, Chattanooga, Tennessee market. Um, that was something that we did on our photography business was to, to give gifts to our clients when they were booking with us. And it was, it was a fun thing because certainly these gifts aren't expected. Uh, so they're, they're spending money with us. They think they're giving us something. And, and in return, in addition to hopefully what is a really positive experience, and I love that you focus on that experience, Allison, you're, you're also saying thank you back to them and giving them a little something. We used to, we actually partnered, you spoke about relationships with vendors in the area and we partnered with a local shop called Sophie's. Tamara is just an absolutely wonderful, wonderful person. She owns uh, owns Sophie's and we would uh, purchase gifts from her and put those in a bag in something like a, a an exclusive candle and um, a game that they could, that the couple could play together and uh, these types of things that were that were unique, that were something that they would that they might enjoy um, together or individually, and ultimately just said thank you. And it was a nice additional touch that was unexpected, and it was fun to be able to do something like that for for the clients. A, a little bit of added thought uh, about them, and uh, I really think that kind of thing makes a difference. So I love that you share that. Maybe take us to one more big idea that that enabled you to be able to take advantage of opportunities in this move. And, and I, I'm glad that you pointed out it was only May of this year. I, it makes it that much more impressive that you've had this kind of success <laughs> with your business in such a short amount of time. But what's one more big idea or principle that will enable our listeners to take advantage of opportunities? Yeah. Um, I definitely think that uh, it's really, really important to also really tune into what your inner and outer networks are. And I think, again, you know, obviously meeting new people all the time is great, but also just 
making a list of all the clients you've had. You know, what last year, uh, if you shot weddings or if you shot family sessions, like who are those people that you worked with? Do you have their emails? Um, if not, make an email list. If you're not booking, maybe, you know, you're looking to book anything or if you're booking, you want family sessions or if you are wanting the, you know, an engagement session, think about, you know, how do you know them? I have friends who definitely know people who are getting married or I know um, couples last year who already have a baby, you know, from their wedding. And so having this email list and just checking in with those connections is huge. I did that also for this year and it turned out my cousin, you know, they were uh, getting married as well. And they were just doing, he, he was actually in the army. And so his wedding date wasn't really for sure. And so they were looking for someone who could be flexible, but I had no idea that they were having a hard time. That side of the family, we really only get together for huge things. So I wouldn't have known, you know, that he wasn't even like looking for someone like that. And so just tapping into those networks is huge. And I think you can find definitely opportunity within it. If you take the time to contact, if you take the time to make an email list, for example, another way that I did it was I made when I made my list of families I had worked with, whenever I have mini sessions, you know, I take that whole list and I just say, you know, do a BCC and I say, hey, here's an opportunity. So if I have 250 people on an email list, yeah, not 250 are going to opt in for the mini session. But even if I get, you know, 10 people, that's huge. And how do you do this? Uh, this is an interesting, I guess, approach to continuing to maintain, proactively maintain your network for the sake of your business. How do you do this though and make sure that you keep it personal? Because, you know, when I think email list, I automatically go to these companies or even individuals in in the photo industry. You see them kind of taking advantage of marketing to email lists and there's constantly an offer and it constantly feels like they're selling to you in one way or another. Um, and, and it doesn't feel very personal. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it's kind of taken, feel taken advantage of. And, and I want a personal connection with somebody and I'm certainly willing to spend money with them, but I don't want to feel like uh, a marketing object, you know? So uh, yeah. how do you, how do you maintain a personal connection or personal touch through these emails? Are you writing them individually to each one of these people or how do you, how do you go about it? Yeah, it kind of depends. So I love using email lists. Is there a little, you know, really, really long? I do try to add some kind of value to the email that is not just, you know, like, hey, sign up for this if you want. So I think a good example is when I send, you know, maybe an email out to a couple, you know, potential clients for weddings, I made this guide called how to rock your wedding photos. And so I say, you know, let me know if you need anything. But in the meantime, enjoy this new guide that I made so they can read it and have enjoyment or have find new ways to improve their wedding experience, even if it's not with me. So add value then. Yep. Add value. And I think what you were saying too, um, I totally understand what you're saying about not making it seem like, Hey, you're just a number. I definitely try to email each. What I do is I keep the email list in a spreadsheet, but I also keep notes on each family. So, you know, Henry and Joe from this family, like they love dogs and they live in this area. And they also, last year we did this session. And so if I do tap into them, you know, as a possible mini session person, I say, Hey, how's Henry doing? Yeah. I remember when Joe, you know, last year when Joe had her session and she was three months old, like she loved this, you know, how is she doing now? And, and definitely starting out with that and not just saying like, Hey, I want you to, (laughs) I want you to sign up for these mini sessions. Yeah, that, that the last thing that we want to feel like is is a number, and I think it's it's interesting now that through technology we have the opportunity to make an individual feel unique and special, and um, taking advantage of something like a Google spreadsheet. At, there you are with your your Google Docs again. I love that. <laughs> but but then you know we can use something like a CRM to, to also to keep up with these kinds of details with regards to somebody and make that connection personal. I think that's so important. And I think that's a wonderful example for our listeners. This has been just a wonderful conversation. We normally stop at about an hour. We're way yeah. over that at this point, but I, I don't mind that at all. 
you've had so much wonderful information to share with us, uh, Allison, and, and the story is a fascinating one at that. Uh, your personality is lovely and inspiring and encouraging too. And um, I really appreciate you making time for the Boca podcast today. Where can our listeners, I know we, we mentioned your website and Instagram earlier, but if you'll just share with our listeners again, where they can find you online, where they can follow your work and what you're up to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you again for having me. This has been wonderful. Oh, it's been so fun. Yeah, definitely. If you want to check out my website, it's just www.allisonhopkins. So Allison with two L's, hopkins.com. Um, and my uh, Instagram is just at Allison Hopkins Photography. But yeah, I post everything um, pretty consistently up there. So definitely check it out and shoot me a message if you'd like. But yeah, that's where everything is. Perfect. Well, we'll make sure to link to both the website and Instagram and the resources that we mention in the podcast in the show notes. Uh, for those of you listening in, if you don't visit uh, the show notes, make sure you do. There's a lot of information that our guests are sharing and we're linking to that in the show notes. Just go to Boca Podcast, B-O-K-E-H podcast.com. And uh, you can see the show notes both from Allison's, uh, my conversation with Allison, as well as other conversations. Lots of helpful information there. Thank you again, Allison. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening to the Boca podcast today. Will you let us know what you think by leaving a review of the podcast in iTunes or maybe in the Apple podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast, maybe suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My direct email is nathan at photographersedit.com. The Boca Podcast is brought to you by Photographers Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com. <laughs>